I'm not 100% sure what the title is for today, but I'm told it's something like planting a tropical garden. It is. So anyways, I started, uh, Mark wanted a tropical beds out here in front of the Arboretum again. So uh, that's why we're out here in front of the Arboretum uh, on both sides of the entrance um, uh, is where I've done the work and started. Uh, there'll be some additional non-tropical plantings further down later on. But uh, I forget how long ago it was now. We had the new uh, entrance done here. And at that time, we used to have beautiful raised beds here that had wonderful soil. Well, those, all that soil disappeared. We had the crappiest stuff that they left us there. Uh, it was very hard clay, not a whole lot of stuff to work with. And that's something that whenever you're doing a uh, bed in general on your own yard, uh, many of you are moving into new homes, uh, or just even an existing area uh, where you've had construction done, there's often this terrible stuff that is left behind. It's not the greatest place to, to start planting. Uh, another reason for doing tropical right now is what was our weather yesterday and today for that matter? It was, uh, I think, 89 yesterday was the official reading at the airport here in Raleigh uh, and 70% dew point at some point and it's probably about that right now. I hadn't looked at the actual temperature at this moment, but so we're getting into that season when tropicals are really going to start doing their thing in the landscape. So this is a perfect time for me to re-landscape an area here as well as um, uh, get your plants in the ground, regardless if you have terrible soil like I was starting with here. Um, this front part right here, um, and actually all of it, I'm not going to show you what I actually did, but I'll tell you what I actually had to do here. It was nice North Carolina clay uh, here until right in front of the sign until about a week and a half ago. And on actually behind the sign on, in the inside of the uh, Arboretum and ac just across on the other side of the entrance until yesterday, when, or not yesterday, until Monday when we came out here, I cleaned up, I took out the things I didn't want and um, started amending the soil. So that's what I wanted to start with here is amending soil is something to do in the beginning and all your tropicals will really appreciate that. Uh, they tend to like rich soils, um, often moisture retensive though, or at least well drained. Uh, Cause I have some plants in here that aren't necessarily dry. I mean, moisture loving plants, but some that'll, uh, can actually take very uh, dry soils, but getting that clay broke up and, uh, using organic matter and in the case on this side over here, I actually use permatill again. I didn't put any on the other side or back here, but uh, amend that soil with whatever you have available to break up, uh, uh, prepare that soil for those new plants because they're not gonna like that clay. I probably dug down six to eight inches uh, and mixed in compost and permatill on this side. And this was the worst part actually over here. Uh, that side was not anywhere near as bad as here. And then right where Chris normally parks his car on the other side of the, the sign here, that was also lovely stuff, I have to say, um, to work with. So it was a, a nice hard pan clay. I used to mattock occasionally, um, but I, I turned it all by hand. Uh, I did have a little bit of help on the uh, to do the amending itself on, on Monday, but um, it was all done by hand. We did not use any equipment. So this is something you can do at home. It's not something that um, it takes machinery to do. It just takes like a spade fork, a good shovel, uh, maybe a mattock occasionally to get that really nasty um, stuff broken up, uh, but you can do that. and. Any material, when I say organic matter, we have access to some really good compost, which is just a continuation of the composted leaves we use here at the Arboretum as our mulch. These are some that were broken down almost into a very fine, not quite sand, but you know, it really nice compost. And then uh, the permatil is something um, that's great to, uh, to keep that clay from binding back up, but the organic matter will do the same thing. And it also helped, uh, um, uh, if you have sand, for instance, uh, further south and east of here where you're in the coastal plain, uh, the organic matter will help um, hold your nutrients, which is an issue you have. Uh, we don't have that issue here. Clay is actually wonderful for holding nutrients. And all those tropicals really appreciate, the, uh, or for the most part, appreciate um, a lot of nutrients in their soil to be so fast growing. And right now, it, the, I don't know if, um, 
Alexander can show you, but it's a little bare looking here, but I can see I planted this Monday last week uh, in here and there's portulaca down here in the front and the foreground and they're, they have like tripled in size since I planted them uh, just over a week ago. And it's because I amended that soil. Uh, and I've been watering in here every few days, actually, just because we haven't had a good rain uh, in, in this case too. But um, so the basics though, like I said, amend your soil before you start to do anything. And this is a great time, like I said, to do this uh, because we're early in the season. This is a perfect time. Get your plants when they're small. You don't have to have a big plant. It will grow so quickly at this time of the year. Uh, I didn't, because our, uh, our space is actually quite tight here, I didn't include one of my favorite plants, the giant, uh, Thailand giant uh, elephant ears, uh, Colocasia gigantea, Thailand giant, but it gets so big, if I started with a plant that was about three to five inches tall right now, it would be way too big in here, it, but it would, uh, by the end of the summer on this sh a little tight spot, so I didn't use that, um, but one of my favorite plants, and you can plant it when it's only this big right now, and it will get this big by mid to late summer, and you have a spectacular plant. So anyways, I'll talk a little bit about some of the plant material I have in here, um, and why I did this some of the uh, too, and why you could do this. Um, like I said earlier, for those who are moving into a new house, you may have some basic landscaping there, and the, but the soil is probably really crappy. You might not want to put anything that's really expensive long-term in there. You might want to work on your soil in the short, uh, or actually for a couple years before you get anything that's really high dollar plants. So you can use a lot of our um, summer annuals, which are in reality, most of our summer annuals are tropical uh, perennials. And um, so from our portulaca uh, to lantanas and salvias are subtropical tropical plants and fit right in this type of landscaping. Uh, as well as I have bananas in here, for instance, as well. Those are another much larger, of course, growing um, tropical that you can uh, plant around here. Some of them are hardy, some of them are not. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that too, hopefully. Uh, but like I said, great, uh, tropicals are really good to use as a beginner uh, for your landscape because they do fill in so quickly most of the time. Um, and it, so you can fill in the, you can buy a smaller shrub that costs you a little bit more uh, and space it out. Don't do like the landscapers do and put things, lower petal them on a three, uh, uh, two feet apart and expect them to not have to be pruned every week. Um, you can start with the smaller plants, space them out, and they'll grow together naturally over time. In the meantime, you can plant your tropicals in there uh, and uh, uh, that will do well here for us in our summer. And in the meantime, that what you're doing in there is gonna amend, uh, putting those plants in there, whether they live or die uh, in the winter, they're gonna help um, improve your soil. So, um, it's, they're, they're great to use as an early landscape. Um, so I'll show you a few of the things here that I have in this bed. And I have some things that are hopefully be a little bit more permanent. Some of them I may move in and out. And then there's others, it's like they're totally utilitarian and they're just gonna be here for the summer and they're gonna go away. Um, so anyways, um, let's see what I have around me back here. So I mentioned bananas and I love bananas, but again, I said, this is a tight spot here. Um, there's one that does very well for us here in this area and it's very hardy. Uh, Musa Bajju, for instance, but it gets too big for this spot and I did not want to have to deal with it here. We have it in our Asian Valley uh, planting and I've taken literally uh, trailer loads of uh, the rhizome out of there before and I really need to do it again sometime, but that takes a lot of energy. And actually a big piece of equipment is a very useful thing for that, but haven't gotten there. But the bananas I have out here, um, there's actually a reversion of one uh, called II in here. It's just a green uh, reversion on it. It's not the, the II anymore. It's very tropical, very tender. It won't make it through our winters very often. If it does, it's really reduced in its growth. And then there's this one here, Siam Ruby, which again, a very tropical one, though it's one worth taking a division and bringing it in through the winter and keeping it. Um, this uh, beautiful red foliage with speckling of green and also a green midrib pretty often uh, really stands out. And uh, 
it'll make a nice show. It doesn't get enormous. It might get five to six feet tall probably by the end of summer, uh, unlike some of the other bananas that might be 10 and 15 feet tall if they were really happy like Musa Baju. And also they, the Musa Baju would be is six or eight feet wide by the end of the summer and fill, it'd be much too big for what I want in this landscape here. So uh, I've opted for something a little bit more on the um, manageable size for this location. Uh, some other things I have in here, and there's so many, are alocasias and colocasias. So the elephant ears. Um, this is one that's been around, tried and true for us uh, for decades. This is alocasia portadora. It's a hybrid. Um, this one can actually get five or six feet tall again, too. It has a much more rigid leaf, and I love the, um, the edge of the leaf. It has just... It, uh, it undulates and there's not quite serration there, but it's just kind of almost lobed. It's just a really nice plant. This will easily be like this tall by the end of the summer if I give this good nutrients uh, and water in this location. Um, this one is reasonably hardy and will survive a lot of our, uh, our winter weather here even. It'll just die to the ground and come back up from the base in the winter if I leave it. Other, you don't have to. You can also dig it up, store it and dry for the winter. It's pretty easy going. Um, but others, uh, the uh, elephant ears would be things like the colocasias, which there are so many of them available right now. Um, the ho there's some of the Hawaiian series that are great. I didn't include any of these those in this border here, but um, uh, they're widely available. And so many of them are actually hardy here, and they do give you that tropical look uh, without doing too much uh, to them, other than giving them a little bit of food and water. Uh, and that's a key thing here with some of these. I will need to water this when we have hot dry spells, even after it is established, um, for them to do their best. They can, I can let it go and, and they'll be fine, but they'll be really happy if I do give them a drink every now and again. Hiding back in here is another plant that I really adore, and I've probably heard talked about them uh, last summer. I know when I did talk about tropicals, and that was like July when I did that. So it was a bit different time, not the best time to talk about planting tropicals, but actually showing you some. Uh, here, and I have some on that side, and I've actually put some over on the other side too, is Penicetum black stockings. This is an awesome plant. Unfortunately, not ever, it's not sold widely. Um, this is a borderline hardy Penicetum, and it's a black foliaged one. And it Right now, uh, and these have doubled in size since last week. I don't know if it can be, it's visible or not, but it's about a foot and a half tall and has two or three stalks. But uh, this will be 10 to 12 feet tall by the end of summer and only about two and a half to three feet wide. So it's really convenient to squeeze in in a tight spot. And right here, I, I, I don't, like I said, I don't have a lot of depth here. So this will give me some really, uh, make a big statement with this plant. It'll be a great backing for the other plants in front of it. Uh, and also having the fence behind it. If we do have a tropical storm or hurricane, it, it does have a habit of lodging or falling over, leaning over if we do have a uh, really strong wind. So with the fence behind me, this is a wonderful place to have this. Um, another really cool plant that <laughs> I don't know who's selling this one, but it's one we uh, uh, were able to acquire several years ago. Doug was able to get it from our friends at Hoffman's Nursery. They were throwing it out, actually. Uh, it's, a, it's a perennial corn, though it's not hardy here. Um, and I can't think of its name. It's Zia Perennis. It's like winning streak or something like that. But it's a variegated perennial species of corn, forms clumps about yay big, and it only gets about two to two and a half feet tall. Uh, but the foliage is awesome on it. It's green with white stripes and there's pink uh, tones to that uh, as well. So uh, it's another really great grass uh, that we're, I've used in this bed. Uh, these are all so quick growing. I have a couple coleus I threw in here. I did not look at the name on these. I don't remember. There's some from our trials left over. Um, I, uh, so I don't remember what that one is offhand, but uh, uh, coleus are now lumped into the genus Plectranthus. They had been in another genus. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh darn, Solanus Damon for the last 15, 20 years. But right now they're putting them into Plectranthus, which are your Swedish ivies. So Swedish ivies, which I don't have in here uh, per se, uh, aside from the coleus, also awesome plants to use in your tropical landscape for the summer. They will take off so quickly and fill in uh, in a, diff a difficult spot. 
Uh, just getting started, and I have t actually three different lantanas that are just babies, but these will get probably two by three anyways. Um, these are some of the Luscious series. Um, on, uh, there's three different Luscious ones in here that I have. Those uh, will be great filler. We can all grow lantanas here. Some of them are hardy. Some of the Luscious have been hardy enough to survive our winters. Not, uh, it's not one of the real diminutive uh, little bushy ones that only get this big and don't, um, they're great for bedding, but they aren't uh, a perennial for us here. A lot of the Luscious ones though do survive for us. Uh, and actually in front of our sign, I didn't want to have anything that would uh, obstruct it. So I put in some things that we had in the nursery. Uh, several years ago, uh, Bobby Ward, um, uh, a, a member here and a good friend of the Arboretum and mine as well, personal friend, he was moving and he and his, uh, 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 he, he was thinning some of the plants he had uh, before the move. And he had this tropical um, agave, Joe Hoke. Uh, which is a very tender one, I might add. We had it on our roof garden in a container during the last uh, moonlight in the garden we had in 2019, and it kind of got zapped, but it survived. It came back in the nursery. Uh, it's actually now flowering, but I took off a whole bunch of the pups and I propagated them. It's grown very well for us. Uh, this uh, only uh, foliage wise, it'll only get about 12 to 15 inches tall. So great for in front of our sign here or in front of the uh, uh, a bed. Um, it's not as mean as many of your agaves. It does have uh, spines, but it's relatively thin, flexible leaves, much more like uh, their cousins, the man uh, Fridas, and now their inner generics, mangaves, which I have used in several places along the border here too. But to go with those, I wanted a ground cover. And uh, earlier I said I had por uh, portulaca in here and we had one portulaca in the trials this year and I stole every single plug we had extra. And unfortunately it's a yellow, I would have rather a pink or orange, but uh, for the contrast, but this yellow one's starting to fill in already, even after just a, a little over a week of growth of uh, being out here. So um, it will act as a ground cover and that's something, um, you don't necessarily think about when you're doing uh, bedding plants or tropicals in this case, or the aspects of different plants. Some of them will act as ground covers, some are gonna be the foreground, and some of them are gonna be big, bold, uh, bold things. So um, the foliage on Joe Hoke is spectacular and is reason enough to grow it. Uh, but I think with having the, uh, uh, um, the carpet of, um, portulaca underneath it, it'll even make it more stand out. Um, in this situation. So, um, I don't know if you can get this one, but um, there's one back here. If we can get back here, you might be able to see. Uh, this is a, a new cultivar of, actually we have two new cultivars of a butylon in here. Uh, this is one we got from our friend, uh, Pat McCracken at, oh darn, what's his nursery? Um, at Garden Treasures, thank you, Chris. Um, this is a Butylon Megapotamicum Red Heart. He got this from somebody, I think, in either Oregon or Washington. He said the original plant was 10 or 12 feet tall, uh, crawling up through something. Uh, it's so it's much more upright than um, one called Little Imp that we have uh, been growing for decades here in the garden. It is very hardy. This thing, every node has flowers on it and every flower bud on it, uh, a flower bud, at least one. And they're a little smaller than um, the flowers on Little Imp, but I am really already impressed by this. And I'm hoping it will go up and fill this corner. This is one that should be perfectly happy and content with us in the, uh, our climate. Most of the mega, straight megapotamicums like Little Imp and uh, even straight megapotamicum uh, do very well for us and flower most of the year, even in the winter when we're mild. Um, Little Imp only goes down to the ground on very rare occasions when we get in the low single digits actually, you know, five-ish. Um, so I anticipate this one being a nice shrub even to persist after uh, this border is torn apart this fall. I'm gonna leave that. Um, but, and I wanna see how tall I can get it to go up. I'm hoping I can get it up over on, on this fence here. So uh, I'm gonna have some fun with that one, I believe. So um, I, I unmuted Tim just to add that Little Imp is our plant in our photograph collection that has been in flower the longest time throughout the entire year. And that's over many, many, many years. There's one time, the uh, last, I don't know if it was 17 or 18, I think um, I had seen it flowering for at least 15 months consecutive. 
Yeah, it's so, pretty impressive. Uh, I without Iris, stopping. I think Iris again and again comes the second yeah. closest, but it has big periods of time when it's not in flower. Yes. This, I mean, all the time in flower. Uh, there's another, on that end, there's another new abutilon we got actually from the Atlanta Botanic Garden called Traffic Island. Uh, it's gonna, it's not a, 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 a excuse me, it's not an abutilon negopotamicum. It, it might has pictum or something else in it, but it's gonna, I don't expect it to get anywhere near as big as this, but it's gonna have, it has a nice orange flower with a dark uh, calices uh, on it. It's going to give me a totally different look. It's down near the banana at that end. Uh, right in front of me, you, I think you can probably see, I have a palm here. This is one I actually had out in the planting I did last year. I dug it and brought it in, though. I planted one of these in, our southwest, or in the southwest part of the Arboretum in the Zurich Garden. It made it through the winter, though it defoliated. It's, it's pushing new fronds. This is Washingtonia robusta. Uh, so this is one of the... Um, Fan palms from the Western, uh, how does it see it? Robusta, I think, is that the Mexican one? Or is, no, or is Folifera? Is, pardon? Yeah, it's the Mexican one. But, um, so it survived. So um, I may bring this in again, but I wanna see what it does here this summer. Uh, it's already, it it's, looks way better than it did uh, last year when I planted it. And I'm hoping it'll get a couple more feet on it this year because it was kind of tortured when I planted it last year. This year, it's a lot more vigorous and I think it's gonna really um, go quickly this year. So it's it's pushing three, two or three new fronds right now, uh, even since I've, I brought it out. Um, again, I have some allocation, another allocation in here. This is a tender one down at this end um, called Regal, Regal Shield, uh, which is one that, uh, it's a dark leafed one. And I really ha like that one. I actually have that as a pot plant in my apartment too. So uh, it's one that, um, easy to overwinter inside. We've actually also overwintered the last couple years in the uh, Asian Valley. I don't, I haven't looked to see if it's popped up yet this year. It's a little early. Uh, they came back up last year. So and they were there for at least a year or two before that. They were in there in 19 and 20 when no one was here to see them. They looked great. And then I they, there were a couple that made it uh, and it were up last year in 21. So uh, we'll see if it made it into 22. It's one that's a little bit more borderline for us in this climate. So um, we get to play around a little bit with stuff. And that's something you can do at home as well. We don't always know if some of these tropicals will actually be hardy. I think, Chris, you mentioned you had a bromeliad? Yeah. And it's... Oh, let me unmute. I don't have any out here, but... Had, had to unmute. What was that? What was it? it was the brown one it that was we an, had last It was year. some kind of pineapple that Doug had that he uh, we got rid of and he gave you some. Yeah, Doug, Doug gave home. me a cluster. I planted it really late in the season and I assumed it was dead, so I dug it up. And it actually still had green parts to it that- Do you uh, mean brown parts? Uh, well, the <laughs> green, green brown parts or brown green parts, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> that were alive. I, I still put in the compost pile, but my neighbor has one. I gave her a, a uh, gave her one, she potted it up and it was on her deck. Yeah. So it was um, in a, in a screened, screened room, but it- uh, Just it wasn't, minimal protection. It wasn't protected with um, uh, glass or anything. It was just on the screen porch. It could be the dryness of being yep. dry through the winter. So well, knowing them, you it never dry. know what's gonna survive. And I know one of our other, one of our volunteers, um, he's mentioned he has a Monstera deliciosa that has survived several years yep. outside here. And there's a couple philodendrons that uh, do well here. Actually, they die, they grow as uh, herbaceous perennials. I don't have any of those in this planting at this time, but those are some things you might play around with um, in a partial shade area. Uh, this gets a lot of sun, so I've stuck with a lot of sun stuff here. Um, I could have put in, just gone and bought some palms and stuck uh, uh, feather palms in here, but I think they would not like the hot heat right now. So I didn't want to put those in. But if you have a shadier garden, palms, uh, other feather palms that you just buy, they might not make it through the winter, but they could be a great uh, added addition to your tropical garden through the summer months. So I don't know if I can convince these guys to shift for me or not to over there, but I also want to get a swallow of water while we do this myself. Uh, do you need a hand? Oh, that would help. So. And let's see if we can get over here before someone decides to drive uh, in and out of the entrance to the Arboretum. So I might be best actually on the parking lot, right about here. Are you sure? Uh, you're red, I guess it might stand, you might be safe. So anyways. So uh, am I getting back in? Okay, so Alexander says I'm back on in here. So on this side, I actually just planted this morning. Um, 
I wasn't, I thought about doing the actual planting with you guys, but um, I had a, a lot of stuff. It took me all morning to do the planting I did. And I've actually uh, kind of started to draw it out and I've watered it all and mulched it all. So it looks pretty for you. So anyways, some other things that you might think about using in your landscape are vines. Uh, there's a lot of different vines you can use. I only have one right here at the moment, but I went and bought a, uh, a, a mandevilla, and this is a white flowered one. I don't even know the cultivar, but I like mandevillas. And I'm hoping that it might <clears throat> hide these guy wires a little bit ultimately um, uh, from our power line here. Uh, we'll see what happens. So you can use them to cover up things too. Uh, other vines that might be really good, and I don't have in here right now, are some of the Thunbergias, the four o'clock vine, uh, uh, or black-eyed Susan vine, not four o'clock vine, black-eyed Susan vine, uh, which is a really good, fast-growing one. I re refrain from using morning glories just because I fight them from, <clears throat> well, years ago when someone planted them here in the garden. Uh, they are technically tropicals as well, though there's temperate ones as well. Um, I, I, I wouldn't put them in. They tend to have a really good <clears throat> seed. Uh, they build up a seed bank in your soil very quickly and you never quite get rid of them. Um, but the Mendevilla, fine and dandy. Um, so really uh, nice flowers. You can get these whites uh, and reds and pinks. Uh, there's some that are much more compact. They will take a rather dry uh, spot ultimately uh, as well and great in containers. And on this side, I don't have as ready access to water. And so um, I was originally thinking of doing this so I didn't have to drag the hose over here, but there's some things I, I ended up putting in here that are gonna say water me please. So um, anyways, there'll be some that will be less uh, dependent on me dragging the hose to them to see how they do. I need to make them happy. Uh, but some other things that I thought were fun that I put in here, I like asparagus. Uh, this is one that's probably not gonna be hardy for us, but this is asparagus densifolius or densiflorus, I can't remember which, uh, how you say it. The foxtail fern is a common name for this one. And I just love the texture uh, of those. And Doug was saying, oh, I always wanted to do that and into a, um, an under the sea garden. And so I kind of have that texture here uh, in, along with a, one of the mangaves here, I think this is Blazing Saddles over here, kind of get, you get that, those under the sea type thing, uh, appearances. Um, other grasses over here, I have one of the other penicetums. Um, this is penicetum uh, fireworks, which is readily available. It's like a tri-color leaf. Uh, it's, it should get about two and a half, three feet tall right here. Um, again, hoping to cover up a little bit of this lovely guy wire here. Um, but um, I also did some pops of color, um, some Duranta, which uh, is a great tropical for us here through the summer months, form little bushes further south right here. It's bright yellow. There's, uh, there's white and green leaf forms as well. Some of them actually get quite large and will flower. This type stays compact for us here uh, and is uh, really good as a, an herbaceous uh, or a, a, a tender perennial. In Florida and further south, uh, or, you know, zone 9, 8, 8B, you might get it to survive, but zone 9 south, uh, it'll actually form a shrub. Um, and it can be a little prickly in that case, but I don't expect it to get much more than a foot or two tall at most. Uh, but I want that sh uh, shocking yellow foliage to um, give me uh, some color here. A um, couple other things, uh, using the back of our sign here uh, to highlight this. Milkweeds. This is one of the, the tropical milk, uh, milkweeds here, or butterfly weeds. This is... Um, Asclepius carasavica, I think is how you say it, or, or something like that. And I think it's butterfly red. And I got this actually at Logan's yesterday. And this morning I did notice some, actually, uh, there were some caterpillars on it. I don't see it now. It may have fallen off while I was uh, getting it planted, but I'm hoping the butterflies will come here and actually use it, but it'll also give me some great color. And that's something you can do, incorporate into your, your tropical garden. It's something for the, uh, the butterflies to attract, and the monarchs are always needing uh, some encouragement in reality. So uh, since we've taken away so much of their natural uh, food sources uh, by in agriculture today, uh, by uh, spraying out uh, the natural populations of milkweeds, uh, other Asclepias, um, so, uh, also here in the foreground, I included some aloes that we had in the nursery. This is aloe Johnson's hybrid, which I think 
Cindy Cromwell gave it to us, but I believe she got it from um, Dan Hinckley uh, out in uh, Washington, um, Heronswood, formerly of Heronswood uh, Nursery. And um, I don't know if this one's hardy or not, uh, but it's one that flowers very frequently. So I wanna see if it'll uh, give us some good spots of color here. The tubular flowers, I wouldn't be surprised if we get some uh, hummingbirds coming to those. And with the salvias on the other side, that's what I expect to happen there as well. Hummingbirds will like that. And any of the lantanas I have put in here, um, those will be great for butterflies. So I try to have a multi-purpose uh, planting when I do that uh, or, or do this. It's not just all foliage, but um, with the tropicals, I do like to focus on a lot of foliar interest and then have some flowers there just to highlight and pop. And because of that, I have actually, I don't know if you can see them, but there's an irisene uh, way back in here. This is irisene blazon lime. And at the opposite end, I have irisene uh, blazon rose. Uh, both wonderful foliage plants. One's on the yellow side, the other is on the, the pink side. Um, and again, in the center here, I have uh, Strobilanthes diariana, uh, Persian shield which metallic purple leaves. I always love this plant. I've grown this for years as a tender plant back home. Um, it's not hardy at all for us, uh, but it's just one to incorporate in there. And it's one you can readily find. Just about any garden center will have that uh, anymore. And it's, it's a color that you can't get from a lot of other things. So that purple, that shocking purple. Um, I also included a few of the tropical hibiscus. Uh, there's some pink ones I have here. They're not open yet, but these were some smaller growing ones, or smaller ones. And then over here, there's an orange one, which didn't even have a name. And I'm, it was pretty yesterday when I purchased it, but I, I was looking for some hibiscus. There's so many of uh, the tropical hibiscus, the hibiscus rosa sinensis available now. And uh, you can use our native hibiscus as well. They'll give you that tropical look and it'll be fully hardy. Uh, they tend to be in the whites and pinks and red shades. There are some newer ones that are coming out that are getting some more purple tones to them, uh, but you still get way more color possibilities in the tropical hibiscus. You can get multicolored things that are yellow and picotied and um, gray actually in blue tones. They're, they're really interesting to look at, and, but deep oranges, um, there's just some spectacular ones that they have available now. And I actually saw some a few weeks ago of all places at Lowe's. Um, so, you know, you can find them not just at your local nursery, but I hate to say it, at, uh, at your, um, your all-purpose places like Lowe's and Home Depot. Um, as much as I want to support the, uh, um, uh, the uh, growers uh, is a little bit more, it, it, you do find some uh, cool things there now. Uh, they might not get taken to, uh, care of quite so well. So you have to get there the day they get there. It's the only thing. Um, another one I uh, planted over here and I've, I love these and uh, I haven't grown them here in the garden that I can think of for years, but some of the plumbagos, this is uh, plumbago auriculata or, uh, um, and I can't think of the cultivar on this one right now, but it's when uh, you get these soft blue uh, tones on this uh, plumbago. Be great for the butterflies here later on in the summer. Um, hummingbirds will go to the hibiscus as well. So that's a, another uh, thing there. Um, in here, I've also included some things for more of a long-term effect. Uh, out at the coast, commonly planted are Fatsia japonicus. Um, they're, they're used extensively as shrubbery. They are technically a subtropical to tropical plant. So, uh, and we can grow them here. They're not quite so fast, but I put some young plants in here. These are some seedlings we actually grew from um, one of our plants in our lath house. Uh, so they're seedlings of Fatsia japonica sparky. So they're EX sparkies. Um, but I'm hoping that they'll start to give us some structure that'll have for a year round tropical feel in here. They're big leaved. Uh, they'll take, uh, uh, full sun at the coast. I'm hoping they'll they'll take it here. I put some in the various spots along here. So 
I, but I want them there for some long-term structure. Uh, and there are uh, some of the plants that will, like I said, survive. So um, those hardy tropicals, truly hardy tropicals for us. We live in a climate where you can grow so many things and, and it's great that um, we can actually, we bridge the, the cool temperate stuff, but we can also grow subtropical to tropical stuff here in the Raleigh area. Uh, which is a really um, great benefit we have for the diversity of plants we can use in our landscape. Um, let's see, what else do I have in here? I have another palm. This is one I don't know a whole lot about, but we'll see if it's been sitting in our nursery for a long time and I thought I'm gonna finally get it out. It's a Parajubea Perij uh, something or other. Uh, I, have to, I just looked at the name and I don't remember the species. It's a, I believe it's a South American one. Uh, it's closely related to the bootias, I believe, which are the jelly palms that you'll see out at the coast. I don't know if it'll make it long-term in here. I may let it grow out here for the summer and bring it in through the winter It'll, uh, and for a few years before it gets too big or until it gets too big for me to do that. So uh, I have left some other thing. What, what was that? What was that, Chris? No, it was Parajubea, Parajubea. And it started with an S. I have the, actually, I probably have the label buried under here. Well, maybe I don't. Oh yes, I do. Parajubea sunka, S-U-N-K-H-A. Anyways, we'll see what it does, if it does anything for us. Uh, like I said, we've been torturing it in the nursery for several years. It can't hurt to get it in the ground. Um, so it, it might become a, a focal point in here, I'm hoping. Uh, but it'll give us a little bit of texture. But like I said, it's gonna be a lot more like the, um, the bootias or the, the jelly palms uh, in its habit. Other things that I've left in here from previous uh, planting, and I love, I love this plant here. This is Cistus, uh, or Cistus, um, is this Mickey or McGuire's Gold? I can't remember what. This is Mickey. McGuire's Gold has solid yellow leaves. This is Mickey, um, which is one of two uh, cystus that have actually done well for us. And they're uh, gold ones. The green ones don't last for us. These have been here for years. Uh, we've been able to keep in the garden for uh, quite some time. I have another, uh, some other ones in the garden that have been there for years. Uh, they do get ratty after a few years or several years, but. Uh, others just don't survive much more than a year or two. So um, wonderful foliage plant here, uh, and it fits right in in a tropical border, even though it's Mediterranean. So, um, and uh, actually, Plumbago is more of a, a Mediterranean type plant too. So anyways, um, that's a lot of what I've done in here, but uh, does anybody have any questions for me now? I'm going to grab a, a swallow of water here. So too. I am unmuting so I can ask a question. We had one quite a while ago. I think it was from Leah. And I just need to unbury it. See if I can answer it. Uh, so Leah, someone's asked Leah a question about windmill palms. Her okay. friends asked me to find out how much water they need and how often. She says sometimes her leaves turn black. Where, what type of windmill palm? Is she talking? She just says Is she talking palm. a Washingtonia or is she talking a, a trachycarpus? I would assume trachycarpus. Okay, and where she lived, do we know? Uh, Leah, I know is from North Carolina. I don't know what city she lives okay. in, nor do I know where oh, her my. friend lives. I know, uh, the only time mine turn black is when they die. Uh, and I don't, and the trachycarpus, Charlotte area, trachycarpus are the best ones for us in this area. Charlotte, I would assume they'd be very happy too. Um, I don't know why they would turn black. Uh, is the whole plant turning black? Um, just followed up. Uh, Leah, you're welcome to come in and uh, start talking online so we can get the response of you quicker. And anyone else is welcome to type some chant uh, questions to the chat also. The yeah, trackies what are. Last, go what was the last bush she was talking about, please? Well, I was hoping to continue with uh, Leah's question, but maybe she's not hearing us anymore. What was the last one I was distracted? I'm, Someone was bringing a dog into oh, the property. Oh, Cistus. 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 C I S T U S? Yes. Yep. Okay, I'm here, Chris. Oh, there you go, Leah. Um, 
I don't know a lot about it. She just asked me to check it out. She said that um, she's not clear on the watering of it, and some of the leaves are starting to turn a little bit black. Because, are, I mean, are they the old leaves, or are they the new leaves? I'll ask her. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> If it's old leaves, that's normal. The old leaves will actually uh, uh, turn brown and then relax on the, the, the palm itself. They'll, they'll go down. And then I cut them off. I have some more. I cleaned up our ones in the Asian Valley over the winter, but I need to do it again because some of the oldest leaves have continued to die back, which is normal. But and, you know, uh, you, you get all, uh, we all are, we're constantly losing hair and skin, skin particles ourselves. Plants are kind of the same way. They lose leaves. But it uh, shouldn't be turning black, though. I wouldn't think black. Brown? It kind of sounds like they're being overwatered. Yeah, I would think it's better to, to underwater it probably than to overwater it. Um, but if it was a recent planting, too, we didn't have a cold winter, but you can get spear death if uh, sometimes yeah. if it gets real cold. We did have one at the McSwain Center. There's a hybrid, and it lost its uh, last spear or leaf that was starting to form last uh, fall, but it's actually pushing a new spear up, too. So um, uh, I've seen ample windmill palms in this area in gardens that probably aren't watered or oh yeah really they're watered. really uh res they're resilient tough. plants for us here uh in the piedmont at least and i would assume uh, the whole way out into Sha'arlit as well um it, it, that's the best one for us we have trouble with sable uh palmetto as a tree here in the raleigh area i don't know if it's as much of an issue in charlotte as uh, or not but um and unless they also are growing a washingtonia and those really would not want water. Yeah. Um, those are from dry land. It's a dry land species in comparison to the, the trachycarpus, which are Asian in origin. So I've had some people ask about the watering practices. One of them is a volunteer wondering. In and here? I think you might have a helper on Tuesday because of that. Uh, but uh, oh, uh, just got a new message about my stuff. Uh, Kate was wondering how often do you plan on watering the site? Right now, since I just planted it, I watered this morning the whole area, but I had been watering about twice a week uh, The um, is what I plan on doing for the next couple weeks. And then hopefully we'll get natural rain uh, and I'll maybe uh, go off to once a week. Just give it a good drench, a, a good deep watering, not just a, uh, brush over with water. I mean, really good, uh, a good deep watering. It's like this side over here this uh, this morning, it was actually quite dry when I planted it. Um, and so I spent five minutes on just, you know, a, a five or six foot square, uh, really dousing it and getting the water down into the soil. Um, hopefully I shouldn't have to water it again until early next week. Uh, so. So Sandy is wondering, um, do you expect all these plants to survive? And you've commented as you've gone for the ones you do expect to survive because there's a whole lot of them over here that a good hard freeze and they're dead. Exactly. Uh, I don't expect these all to survive the winter by any means. No, uh, but there's you, only a handful. You did mention to experiment. Leave them exactly. in the ground and see Leave if they come in. back. Uh, you never know what will happen. And I get talked, uh, I have relatives now out on the coast and they'll tell me, oh, this survived, which is a half a zone to a zone warmer than us. And it doesn't seem that much, but depending where you're at, you might be able to eke out some things. And I had a lady tell me, who lives actually quite close to where my cousins do, that there's some uh, almost full-size citrus, say, in Swansboro. And it's cool. like, okay, I would have not expected that, for instance, on uh, citrus fruits. Um, we can occasionally get them to survive here, for instance. But uh, uh, and some of the mangaves will melt uh, down to the ground and come back up. It just depends on the winter. We've had so mild winters the last uh, several years. This winter got cold. We got to about 15. Yep. Uh, the Burr. previous two winters, I think we got to 20. Um, 15 and, is zone 8. Yes. And 20 is zone, zone nine. 9A. Barely. So, But in 2018, we got down to 5. So... Um, uh, you never know. It just depends on the winter and the microclimates um, on some of these. I will bring in some things. Other things I won't, you know. I can replace the mandevilla with no problem. And it, uh, you're just going by one of those. The aloes, I might want to bring in some divisions of that in the fall. Uh, we'll see how the asparagus do. Sometimes think, asparagus will make it, sometimes not. You I know. think you might be surprised with the asparagus. Yes. Some forms, it's, it's not consistent. There are some selections that are better for hardiness on them. So... Um, 
but I, I don't a, expect. I had the Plumosa version for years and years and years. It's probably still there. I keep on pulling it up, and it keeps on coming but, back. Yeah, there are some forms, but it's sometimes yeah. it's hardier selections um, that have been made. But um, some of the Mangaves I expect would be fine. I might bring in some starts of them, but not take them and put them all in. Uh, or that is, leave, uh, yeah, I won't take them all into the nursery, but I might take a division or two just to see what happens. The, uh, the tropical hibiscus, unless I really love it, uh, will, will stay out here <laughs> and die. Uh, and I don't expect those to survive at all. Um, plumbago, for instance, is one that's borderline here. Um, and it, if, depending on the winter, if it's well established, it may be fine and dandy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like Chris was saying about his neighbor's um, pineapple surviving on her porch, I'm guessing it is due to just a little bit of protection, but also that it was dry through the winter. It, winter moisture is probably more of a, an issue at killing uh, some of these marginals than anything else and I have to think. from what I they saw, it wasn't even nipped. So, yeah, and if it they're perfectly fine. dry, uh, they'll have no problem whatsoever. But um, if they were wet, they probably would have froze right out. And mine was fine in the garage. Yeah. All righty, the next one is, is when should you prune old stalks of lantana? The new growth is just now coming up. Whenever you have time. Well, that's what I do with mine when I happen to be they next to them. They look terrible the in the winter. Yep. If they die in the winter, they're so quick to grow, just buy another one and replant it. You'll have the same thing again. But I would cut them back in the fall just because they're so ugly. Uh, if it's me and uh, and don't worry about trying to keep them if they survive in in the spring and you um, you know if by the early to mid uh, May if they haven't started to push new growth yeah they're probably gone go to the nursery they have all kinds of uh, lantanas easy to replace it's not like it's a, a really precious plant I hate to say it <laughs> unless it's one that is a pass along plant that is precious to Some, you in that precious. case. They're easy to take cuttings of and store. <laughs> so easy to root lantana. So Candy has asked, can you tell us how to do divisions on elephant ears and other stuff we want to bring in successfully? I would like to remind folks that we do have a YouTube channel. And that was one of our programs that we offered last year. Was that last October, Tim? I think. And I did. Yeah, Jeff, you probably got the banana. I did. I, I don't remember the but. exact title of it. We have a whole entire program, Candy, about that. Where It'll does she live? It'll be on YouTube channel. Just uh, look up um, um, any of our website pages. The bottom right will be a YouTube icon. And uh, all the midweek programs are in a playlist called Midweek. And just scroll to last November or October and you'll find it there. Uh, Tim covered it in great detail. Um, but you can easily divide or take cuttings off of most of these plants. Yeah. And yes, my uh, bananas are doing quite well, Tim. Thank yeah. you. I've wanted Siam Ruby for a long time. Yeah, uh, she was asking about elephant ears, you she said? She said elephant ears. Do you know where she's from? Uh, she has not said that, but elephant ears are, in many cases, hardy in this A lot area. of them are. Not all the alocasias are, but most of the colocasias have proven reasonably hardy uh, in our climate here. I mean, they might not come back with a lot of vigor at first in the spring, but if you, you just have to get one little piece and you can baby that plant and it will come, it'll yeah. actually, if you um, disturb it and amend the soil around it, it'll be a lot more happy than if you leave it. Because I lose them in the garden because I, well, I just let them go and they kind of uh, burn themselves out over time. But um, so I, I would by like, that time, I've gotten something else to, uh, better to replace it with. So I would like to add, I don't think I'd bring that one in my house for winter protection. Yeah. because In our climate here, no, I won't worry about well, it. Unless you really uh, have a, again, have a... Um, a sentimental connection to it. So many. I still of, wouldn't do it. I mean, they're, they're a terrible house plant. They need. Oh, much, I wouldn't keep it actively they need growing. Much more sun. Yeah. They get spider mites. And all I would keep that. them dormant if I brought well, them in. What I wanted to say is, I I often grow mine in containers, and then come uh, late November, I pull them out of the water because they like to sit in water in many cases, and I just let them go dormant, and then they go in the garage off to the side. Yeah. And then come April, I rewater them again and put them outside and they start to grow back. And that's so much better than keeping them inside and growing because they are awful yes. house plants. They awful. need high humidity to be happy. Yeah. Uh, this kind of brings me to uh, something I was gonna talk about. I almost, I almost brought out some uh, tubers of uh, caladiums. I haven't stuck them in the ground yet, but with this warm weather, this is a perfect time to actually plant caladiums, yep. whether from uh, plants that are actively growing or if you find a bag in the store or order some online, this is a perfect time to plant them. The ones growing them dry, uh, from the dry tubers or corms, whatever they are, I can't remember, um, that, those structures, um, uh, th they actually adapt really well to full sun. 
uh, easier than say if you buy one in the uh, nursery and it's actively growing and you put it in full sun, it might go into shock and say, oh, I hate my life. And it'll look terrible for a while. But if you just go and plant those, uh, uh, plant the dry the tubers, uh, they will sprout right up in a matter of a couple weeks and you have really nice plants. They never go through a, a reacclimation uh, if you put them right in where they're gonna be growing. So I have a whole bunch in my office that I've been storing since last fall that we had in other parts of the garden. And they just look like little brown stones more or less right now with dirt on them. So, and some of them actually are pushing growth already. Um, and the easiest way to store those is actually store them dry and warm, put them in like a shoebox or something in your closet, not in the basement, not in the crawl space. They wanna be warm in comparison to all your other um, bulbs that you're gonna store. So. I have some callas that I stored warm last fall. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where I stored them. Oh, they are somewhere. Uh, Caladiums or callas? Callas. Oh, callas. <laughs> yeah. I need, they I can go a little cooler now. too than the, the, uh, yeah. than the I brought them home from my brothers up in Boston and it was the holidays and we put them somewhere and we cannot They're in a box them. with a Christmas item. They probably are. They're Christmas ornaments. All righty, so we had a question. I forget who it was from. Here we go. Patricia is wondering, can you root um, lantana in water? And we don't recommend rooting yeah. anything in water. The roots aren't quite built right, but you can they root are that super, little pot of soil. They're super easy yep. to root in evenly moist soil. With, if you have just basic rooting hormone, it will root in a matter, and just put a bag over it in a bright window, not sunny, but a bright window, you'll probably get roots in a matter of a week or two. Yep. They're super easy. Moro is asked, what is generally more cold hardy, alocasia or colocasia? My experience, I'd say most of the colocasias have been hardier, though there, uh, there's quite a few alocasias that we're finding that have been hardy too. Um, and they, to me, they look totally, the structurally, I like the, the I like them both, but um, I like the uh, many of the upright uh, growing uh, leaves and the texture of the leaf. It's much more substantial on an alocasia to me, and I like those, but there's quite a few that are hardy. So Sandy has asked a non-tropical plant question, okay. but I think we can still address it for her. She has a large section of a juga that seems to have died out over the winter mm -hmm. um, after several years after planting. Is this unusual and what could have happened? I know they quite often melt out in the They'll summer. They'll melt out pretty often. I mean, you'll lose spots. and. and if you do you still have some more of it uh, all yeah. i would do is if you have more of it transplant some back into where it was at they'll sometimes lose their vigor they kind of crowd themselves out over time some sometimes i had a black scallop in one location in the garden for over 10 years and then it finally fizzled out so i it, i think it probably just needed reset um, but, but if you have some, move it back in that area maybe amend your soil and set some in there again i'm guessing that maybe hers just melted out yeah. last summer yeah and um you saw uh, the results just, of it it's just now. missing right now yeah okay they'll quickly fill back in <laughs> uh we have a private message that uh, we should cut it off at four o'clock because we're looking rather toasty outside and someone asked about sunscreen we're okay out here although here comes fedex is gonna run us over no just kidding they're good um linda said should she let her light meyer lemon go dormant during the winter in the garage well meyer lemon is evergreen so it doesn't go dormant it it'll won't just it'll kind of, slow down just you could do that out. if it's bright i wouldn't yeah. leave it if it's totally dark in your garage but if you have just even a dim window to put it in front of and keep it cool it'll probably yeah. just slow down and kind of sit there all winter is my guess yeah. um and linda i can't remember the cultivar but there is a lemon that is hardy in this area. So you might want to try swapping it out for that uh, hardy lemon. And that way you can uh, enjoy your lemons and not have to bring them in. So that'd be pretty good. Well, that is the end of the question. Okay. So we're gonna do a little bit of bragging here. My battery has 71% left in it. Yay, thank you so much for the donation. I can't mention the name because she's not giving me permission to do so. So thank you so much. I'm uh, very happy to have a computer that uh, is not gonna let us down during the programs and hopefully won't overheat unlike those of us out here in the full sun. Well, Tim, thank you so much for sharing uh, the new beds you planted out here at the Arboretum. We do hope that you're able to come out here and, and enjoy them at the Arboretum as sidewalks here. And you're I'm gonna, hoping they grow actually. Oh, they <coughs> will, they already are. <laughs> and there's more plants in them that Tim has not talked about. And my guess is that these are beds that won't be labeled, right? Because they're yeah, temporary. I'm, I'm not planning to have them labeled, yep. though I am mapping them just so I, if, if there is a question I yep. can and someone wants to know, I can probably answer it. 
So come on down, enjoy the plants out here at the Arboretum, have a great display. It is cooling off for this weekend, so they come out here and not enjoy the 90 degree temperatures. They're actually and, calling and for the it. 40s on Saturday, or Sunday and Monday night, I think. Whoa, I think I saw 60s for a, a high on Sunday. That'll, yeah. be, that'll be very pleasant. But thanks, Tim, for a great program. And thank you, Alexander and Stephen, yes. for helping record today's program. We look forward to seeing you next week with a midweek with Doug talking about summer bulbs. See you then. Have an awesome week and weekend.